Welcome everybody to the Forum of Citizens on Regal Regulations. We have named this session involving broad stakeholders for a comprehensive reform. Um, the organizations behind let me see, yeah. The organizations behind involved in this event, we believe that the role of civil society is essential to launch the process of legal regulations, but also for these reforms to be efficient, widely accepted, and duly implemented. Alternative approaches to policing controlled drugs are sprouting up, and there's a need to fill the gap between policymakers and civil society, both in national and international levels. The Forum of Citizens on Legal Regulations will stress the need to include a broad range of citizenship stakeholders, outlining the interactions and complementarities between grown-up proposals and top-down reform processes. So let me briefly introduce you the, the speakers of this session. Uh, first, uh, uh, myself, I'm Oscar Perez, I come from Barcelona. Uh, then we will have three more speakers. The next one will be Agnieszka Siniacka from uh, Warsaw, Poland. I will introduce you better once I give you the, the word. Then we have Jean-Felix Savary from Lausanne, Switzerland. And uh, the last one will be David Borden from DC, United States. And we hopefully have some minutes for the debate for, uh, with the audience. So um, as I was saying, um, my presentation has the title Peer-Based Movement Inputs to Substantially Improve Social Change and Policy Reform. This presentation is based in the Open Society Drug Policy Report. I author it, Innovation Born of Necessity, Drug Pioneering Drug Policy in Catalonia. And this report follows uh, the evolution of two Catalonia's drug policy solutions. One, it's its health and rights-based approach to drug treatment and harm reduction. And the second is the model for safely legalizing the market of cannabis. So in my presentation, I will try to summarize the key points of each of these two perspectives. And now I'll begin with the first one. As I said, health and rights approach uh, to legal, uh, to treatment and harm reduction. Just to give you a little bit of the context, just in case you don't know, Spain is a country composed by 17 autonomous regions, and each one has varying degrees of autonomy. Of Spain's 47 million inhabitants, 7.5 million live in Catalonia, the capital of which is Barcelona. Cat uh, Catalonia long held values of collaborative grassroots uh, action and political autonomy. So um, um, in the late 80s in Spain, we had the highest prevalence of HIV in Europe, and Barcelona had the second highest mortality rate of any city in Europe. By 1980, there were between 60,000 and 125,000 regular users heroin in Spain. Between 1983 and 1990, between 20,000 and 25,000 people died from drug overdose, and 100,000 acquired HIV through injecting drugs. So at that point, while the Spanish Ministry on Health National Plan on Drugs in 1985 viewed the drug situation in biomedical terms and focused its efforts primarily on preventing and treating heroin use through abstinence, the Catalan response was more community focused. So I will explain a bit, a bit more in deep how did it work. So the first democratic elections uh, in Spain took place in 1979, but the year before in Barcelona and few other local municipalities responding to the pressure from the affected families established small centers of care. These local initiatives, often forged by NGOs, were replicated until 1985, when a regional law brought the different interventions under a single umbrella. So during the 80s, from the Catalan administration, there was a strong move to establish centers for treatment and care of those living with drug dependency, and many of these centers were managed by non-profits, and they had a community view of care, and professionals had a strong commitment with social change. So at that point, a biopsychosocial approach was adopted. A biopsychosocial approach considers biological, psychological, and social factors and their complex interactions in understanding the drug use, dependence, and healthcare delivery. The first center offering methadone program was created in Barcelona in 1996, and it was not uh, till the late 90s when the harm reduction programs became conventional. 
coffee and conversation centers, needle exchange programs, consumption rooms, and street work and training active users. So the implementation of harm reduction programs led to the decline in overall mortality rates in Barcelona, which between 1996 and 1999 dropped by 76%. Deaths to AIDS declined also by 85%, and deaths due overdose, which had to begin decline earlier, fell by 83% between 1992 and 1999. So to give a concrete example of the relevance of the approach developed during the 80s and 90s, I will briefly share the history of the drug consumption rooms in Catalonia. By 2001, despite not having public financing, a group of non-profit organizations opened the first consumption room in Cantunis, a marginalized neighborhood. In 2003, the city of Barcelona opened the first official drug consumption room. In 2004, another room was opened. This is Sala Baluar, nowadays an international reference model. But those two rooms were not enough to, for the demand. And in 2005, a third consumption room was announced. When it opens, the well-known not in my back year effort began. Uh, during one year and a half, the neighborhood uh, organized uh, demonstrations, and at the highest point, it gathered like 3,000 people. Nine months after the conflict uh, erupted, the Parliament of Catalonia approved a resolution in which, in which all political parties committed themselves to not support the forces that oppose the safe consum consumption centers. During the next five years, no mention was made for opening new consumption rooms until 2010. At that time, it was agreed that the 10 districts of Barcelona should each one have their own consumption room. These rooms were established throughout the city without any of the earlier backlash. Drug consumption rooms are perfectly integrated in the city and in permanent relation with social services and associations of neighborhoods, of neighbors, sorry. So now I will go to the second part of the report where we uh, discuss the issue of the cannabis social clubs. Uh, just for the ones uh, that are not aware of what a cannabis social club, this is a very brief definition. Cannabis social club is a legally constituted non-profit association of cannabis consumers. A cannabis social club collectively cultivates cannabis plants for its members so that they may avoid the risk of purchasing cannabis from the black market. Those entities had had never a specific regulations within the Spanish legislative framework, but rather are simply grouped within the regulatory framework for non-profit associations. Cultivation of plants meant for personal consumption is not a crime, and there's no specific standard as the number of plants that a person can grow for self-consumption. This legal gap regarding the quantity of plants allowed for personal consumption Coupled with the Supreme Court jurisprudence permitting shared consumption, opened the door for cannabis social club model. So this construct, allowing legal access to cannabis, now internationally as the Spanish model, has had a special impact in, in Catalonia. Here you have a short description of the uh, different uh, phenomena regarding cannabis clubs. So in 1991, Ramon Santos Association of Studies of Cannabis was founded in Barcelona. In 1994, 100 of those members signed an agreement to collectively grow 200 plants. But the Spanish police seized those plants, and three years later, the Supreme Court sentenced it to four, uh, four members of this association to four months of prison and a fine of 3,000 euros. So this experience was a stop, but the next generation of activists get inspired by, by this uh, fight. And in 2001, in Barcelona, the first uh, modern cannabis club was established. And it was the first modern because it was not just a group of people that agree to cultivate some plants. Also, this group of people agrees to rent a place to make the distribution and the consumption of the cannabis. In 2009, we had 14 cannabis clubs in the city. And in 2017, Catalonia has nearly 600 cannabis clubs. 400 of them in the metropolitan region of Barcelona. So in January 2015, the Parliament of Catalonia approved a resolution regarding the public health criteria for cannabis social clubs and the conditions under which the municipality of, of Catalonia could approve the operation. These criteria are the result of the discussion between the two Catalan federations of, Catal of cannabis club and the health department. 
and provides information and guidance on how to reduce risk and harms associated with cannabis consumption. I put here some of the examples of this uh, regulation, for example, harm reduction training for the uh, people working in the cannabis club, prohibition of other drugs or alcoholic beverage inside the club, it sets also the, the minimum distance between clubs and schools and uh, health centers, restricts opening times, prohibits advertising and neighborhood disturbance, members must be over 18 and regular can cannabis users, and also to avoid cannabis tourism, which is a concern that the Barcelona city has a lot. There's a 15-day waiting period between the application of the new member and the membership approval. But uh, this resolution was appealed by the Spanish government and it's currently suspended. So meanwhile, uh, in one side, 30 Catalan municipalities have approve, approved their own uh, licenses and uh, municipal regulations. And also, there's a popular legislative initiative which consists in collecting more than 50,000 signatures to promote a discussion of a law proposal in the parliament. And these 57,000 57, signs were collected for civil society. So actually, nowadays, there's a proposal in the parliament which is expected to be approved during next spring to regulate cannabis clubs. So 20 years since the first collective cultivation of our sect that I explained to you in 1993, the cannabis movement in Spain has become a global point of reference. At the same time, successive national governments have persisted in escalating the repression and punish to the people who consume drugs. So in terms of conclusions, I want to point that, that at a national level, Spain's drug policy are driven in large part by interest of select political powers that have fluctuated within changes of government, national events, and the rise or fall of economy. They are more agenda-based than evidence-based. However, the relative independence of the autonomous regions, regions and the driving force of the grassroots movements has made it possible to develop a drug policies that significantly differ in purpose and in intent from the national policy. In Catalonia, innovative drug policies have been devised that prioritize uh, public health and not criminally punitive, and attempt to balance individual freedom with community concern. So I think that the best way to resume this is with a quote of a retired psychologist that I interviewed for the report, who says, in place where there is a greater sense of common cause and solidarity, the issue of drugs has had better response. I think that is why there is a stronger response here than in other con co autonomous regions in Spain. We have grown tired saying that it's a community problem, and as such, the solution is through the community, not only through professionals or politicians. Where there is a community, there is a, resp a response. So thanks a lot, and uh, now I will give the, the word to Agenitska uh, Sieniatska, the chairwoman of the Polish uh, Drug Policy Network from Warsaw, Poland. And she, the title of her presentation is The Forefront of Democracy, City Level as Key Space to Implement Modern, Efficient and Innovative Drug Policies. Feedbacks from the International Urban Drug Policy Conference. Thank you for the introduction and the invitation made to the panel. It's a great honor and I'm very happy to have the opportunity to share with you feedback from the International Urban Drug Policy Conference, which was held in uh, February 2016. Maybe a couple of words of, uh, about uh, Polish Drug Policy uh, Network. Uh, we are formed uh, as a foundation from 2013, but we are existing as a civil initiative from 2000. Eight. Um, Polish Drug Policy Network was launched by the group of uh, about 150, um, launched by uh, experts uh, dealing with the problem uh, of drug uh, policy in Poland. They gathered together to uh, to change Polish drug uh, policy because it's um, uh, because it's one of the most restrictive uh, in Europe. Um, I can show you a Polish way of thinking about harm reduction in the context of human rights, uh, people who use drugs, uh, people who are addicted, by three indicators. The first one, drug law. Uh, if you are in Poland and if you possess even smallest quantities of illicit drug, let's say half gram of marijuana, be careful because you can be imprisoned after three years. After three years. Uh, 
And of course, uh, the sentences are often suspended, but still, if you will be caught second time and you possess even smaller quantities of drugs, you can be sentenced second time and finally go to the jail. So this is the first indicator. Second one is access to opiate substitution treatment. Uh, of course, we have uh, access to opiate substitution treatment. About 15% of those who need that kind of treatment get it in Poland. But still, uh, this is, cannot be prescribed, um, and it, it, it's still quite, quite limited. The third one is uh, uh, indicator is uh, access to a uh, harm reduction uh, service like needle like exchange uh, needle and syringe exchange programs uh, of course we have uh, access but still it's uh, quite limited and we don't have drug consumption rooms uh, it is very short and simplified uh, examples and indicators but i want to show you the context uh, i want to show you um, how we are thinking about uh, uh, um, approach to human rights, about harm reduction, and uh, dignity of people who use drugs, who are uh, or who are uh, addicted to drugs. Uh, and what is more important, I want to show you how in such not liberal country uh, it was possible to organize conference about local drug policies and to create Warsaw Declaration, which is strong tool for advocacy uh, on uh, changing drug policy at local level. Because in this dark scenario, there are a little shines. And I think the, that little shines are quite good, good cooperation with uh, Polish drug, uh, with um, National Bureau for Drug Prevention, <laughs> which is government agenda dealing with the um, uh, drug policy in Poland, uh, with huge engagement of local NGOs, uh, and NGOs uh, dealing with the problem, and cities official working in the field, like we say in Polish official documents, counteracting drug addiction. So that's why, and thanks to these little shines, uh, it was possible to, to such conservative environment uh, organized second edition of Urban Drug Policies uh, Conference together with the City Hall of Warsaw, National Office for Drug Prevention, and Polish Drug Policy Network as a main co-organizers. Uh, so the first uh, edition of Urban Drug Police Conference was organized in 2010 in Prague. Uh, and it was resulted by a Prague Declaration contains uh, seven principles how to do good effective drug policy. Um, the, dec the, the Warsaw Declaration is a younger sister of uh, Prague Declaration, and it's more like guidelines how to do this, how to do the same, but it's uh, yeah, with, within the category how to do this. Um, and the Warsaw Declaration uh, contains uh, 10 principles, 10 points, which is based on innovative and uh, evidence-informed policies. It's called on reduce harms, ensure public safety, and mostly ensure public health at local level. What, is, what, what, is, uh, what can be also interesting, now we are going in the process of maybe some kind of negotiations with uh, officials to organize the third edition of the conference uh, in Copenhagen in 2018. Uh, in, um, in uh, coming month, we are going um, to Copenhagen uh, with uh, 10 Polish officials to show them good practice, uh, practices at local level, a good model of uh, dealing with the problem. Uh, because uh, Copenhagen example is that, is, it's such an amazing uh, uh, example. Uh, so we are going to meet uh, in, uh, in the uh, city officials uh, to, 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 to move uh, forward the process of organizing a third edition in 2018 uh, in um, Copenhagen. Uh, the idea is also to um, organize uh, the next edition, the third one, the third one. I think it's a good idea to prepare it, um, to organize it in uh, Barcelona, as uh, Oscar um, showed a great unbelievable un unbelievable <coughs> uh, um, model of local uh, drug policy so i think it's also a very uh, good uh, idea also declaration also declaration um, contains 
10 points. Now, I don't want to just show you every single by single, uh, so uh, this is a slide which shows uh, what they're talking about. But um, the whole text of Warsaw Declaration you can find on the website urbandrugpolicies.com. Uh, about 170 people, uh, individuals and organizations signed it uh, up to now. And uh, please read it. And if you agree with the idea with, uh, of Warsaw Declaration, uh, just sign it. Uh, there is a mechanism on the um, uh, urbandrugpolicies.com. There is a mechanism, very simple. So, uh, yeah. I think it's, uh, but when we're talking about Warsaw Declaration, I think it's a more uh, important thing about how we can use it. Uh, the Warsaw Declaration, in my opinion, is not just a, just a piece of paper, but it can be something more important, more strong. It can be strong policy paper, an important tool uh, used in advocacy work, not only at local level, but also at the European level. And that's why our, uh, as Polish Drug Policy uh, Network steps, are directed at EU level. In coming months, we are going to planning, uh, we are going to um, proceed a series of moves um, and starting the process of changing drug policy at local level, but by EU policy. Uh, we are going to organize public hearing and a site event in EU institutions. So, first of all, um, we're going to organize public hearing in the European Parliament, uh, thanks to the kind support of one of uh, members of uh, EU Parliament, uh, Michał Boni. Uh, the, the, we're still waiting for the last term. Uh, uh, it will appear on the website, uh, Urban Drug Policies uh, com, but probably it will happen on May that year. Uh, the event is dedicated to implement minimum quantity standards of urban drug policies included in Warsaw Declaration and to exchange experience of best practices uh, in whole European cities. So currently, um, the European Union is carrying mid-term evaluation um, uh, of EU drug strategy and uh, also preparing the second action plan to EU, drugs, to EU drug strategy. So we couldn't imagine the better time to appear with the Warsaw Declaration in European Parliament um, and to use Warsaw Declaration as a tool of, of, of advocacy work. Moreover, we are going to organize event on urban drug policy on, in the Committee of Regions. Uh, Committee of Regions is an uh, advisory body uh, uh, of uh, European Union which decide how local policy should look like. Drug policy never appeared in the Committee of Regions, but if we're talking about uh, the topic in the context of public safety, it is possible to, um, to make a drug policy a part of a uh, local drug strategy uh, prepared by a uh, Committee of Regions. So we are going um, a bit there at, uh, in June 2017, that year. So we hope to help implement uh, guidelines of urban drug strategies in all European cities and provide advice to uh, members of European Parliament and uh, EU uh, decision makers. Uh, so the, um, the events offer a unique opportunity to launch a cooperation among uh, NGOs, among civil society <laughs> members, municipality authorities and decision makers at EU level. So if you are interested in... Um, uh, in uh, um, involvement in um, using Warsaw Declaration or events which I uh, uh, which I said about, uh, please contact me and don't int and uh, remember to sign the Warsaw Declaration uh, by mechanism on UrbanDrugPolicies.com. Thank you for your attention. Thanks. Thanks a lot. So now I will introduce Jean-Félix Savary, the Secretary General of GREA, the French-speaking Swiss group uh, for research on addictions from Geneva. I think before I didn't say Geneva, sorry, uh, Switzerland. And the title of the presentation is From a Grassroots Model to a Local Regulation, City Health Cannabis Clubs in Switzerland. Your time. 
Thank you very much. Um, so um, maybe it's a little bit short to describe all the Swiss policies, so um, I will try to be brief and maybe to uh, add one comment on this uh, very good Warsaw Declaration, I think, because uh, number two said uh, we need innovation in drug policy, and this is exactly what I, I want to stress out uh, today. Um, Maybe some of you have made some kind of management course or IQ test or whatever. Problem, problem solving, you know, always the same, you know. You have one problem, you don't find the solution. So what is the solution? Always think out of the box. You know? And it applies always, and I think it also applies to our, um, our uh, thematic here. And maybe you also realize that when you think about drug policy, uh, it seems that you think slower, or you don't think, or at least it is very difficult to think about drug policy because we have so many representation on this topic and uh, maybe expert more than others. So it's always difficult to find ways. But as we also know, uh, there is problems and uh, there is problems to be solved at local level, especially in cities as uh, uh, it was mentioned. Um, and so we should we are uh, responsible to uh, respond to this uh, demand of the population to reduce these problems and so the the swiss model often we refer to switzerland as pragmatic it's not pragmatic it's just uh, it has this direct democracy thing like this addiction to vote we always vote we always want to vote so we need to listen to what the problem are what the th citizens think, what the neighborhood think, and when they ask to reduce problems they are facing, we need to listen to them, otherwise uh, um, the project cannot be uh, implemented. And this is why um, we uh, begin to develop another approach in Switzerland. And I would say the first step is that we have to realize that we don't know that well. We don't know that well how to manage uh, drug policy. What we know so far is that prohibition doesn't work uh, or, or that it um, brings a lot of problems. But we don't know really how we should go next step. Uh, maybe there is some other experience, but we, we have to, to test things. And the first step we have in Switzerland is in the, in the 80s, where we have this big uh, heroin crisis. I think um, it was this um, uh, attitude, this posture to to say, okay, we don't know. So we, the expert, we don't know. The police, okay, we don't know how to reduce the market. Uh, the doctors, okay, it's difficult. And then we have to think again and think out of the box and to include new actors, to include everybody, neighborhood, users, police, all uh, different actors, and maybe some have ideas, some have strange ideas, like uh, open consumption room. The first one was established in, in Bern in uh, 86, first in the, in the world. At the beginning, it was really a crazy idea for many people, but the crisis was very big. So we said, okay, this one has an idea, so let it try. Let, let him try his idea, and we will try to see if it's a good or a bad idea. We'll study the result of this idea. And it turned out it was a brilliant idea. Uh, some other people had other ideas. It was not good. We see the results were not good, so we didn't do it. And um, so through this kind of um, testing, um, moving forward step after step uh, in, in a fog, we don't know really, then we developed this uh, four pillar strategy with air and prescription and so on. And this was allowed because of room for innovation. Without innovation, it's very difficult to uh, learn because you uh, end up in the status quo. So um, what's going on today with this uh, cannabis regulation? We have implemented um, policy in the 90s where we uh, managed to reduce significantly health problem, uh, crime problem, um, different uh, issues, but still we didn't dare to um, make the move to regulate the market. We tried, but we failed. So uh, then 20 years later, what happened? The problem is still there, and there is a black market, and there is drug dealers, and there is a feeling an unsafety uh, with this uh, problem. And so uh, people think again uh, of new solutions and new innovation. And 
it's interesting in Geneva, we had a group of politicians, they met uh, to find a solution to end uh, these drug dealers. End it. It's like a, more like a um, security issue. And so they were studying this, uh, this question for a year, and at the end, they found a new solution, which, which was so regulate the market. And uh, then we had to, uh, to try to, to find uh, some kind of uh, solution how to do it. And uh, so we like Spain, we like uh, Catalonia. We said, oh, wow, Catalonia is good. <laughs> We're going to try that. Another city nearby, Bern, they said, OK, no, we want that maybe to, to test it with a pharma pharmacy, like uh, to have it uh, as regular drugs in a pharmacy. Um, another city, they say, oh, this is an issue for psychiatric. We should medicalize all that. OK. So now, in this year in Switzerland, we are trying to launch this project. So remember, Switzerland is always slow. Huh? <laughs> and so we are not so fast. But so we are going maybe to launch this project this year. And we will see what is the best model for our communities, what is the best model for health, for safety, what is cost effective, what works, what can be supported by the population. And so uh, if you cannot make innovation, you cannot learn. And if you innovate, you have to uh, evaluate as well. And when you make uh, innovation, you evaluate, you see if you get public support, and if you get uh, a good solution, then you will be able to make the step, uh, the next step forward. So I think I will keep it here. Thank you. Thanks a lot. Thank you, uh, Jean Felix. And now it's the time for David Borden. He is the executive director of the DRCNet Foundation, also known as the StopDrugWar.org, from Washington, D.C., United States of America. And the title of his presentation is Civil Society Movements Slow March to Consensus The Example of State Level Mobilizations to End Cannabis Prohibition. Uh, thank you. Uh, appreciate being on this panel. Um, StopTheDrugWar.org is a broad uh, drug policy reform and anti-prohibitionist organization. Uh, we support um, the uh, harm reduction type of reforms discussed by my fellow panelists. Uh, but today, uh, a lot of what uh, we do in the United States does have to do with uh, cannabis legalization because of uh, what's been happening there. Uh, and so that's, uh, that's what we'll talk about. Um, uh, November 8th uh, was a remarkable election day uh, for initiatives to legalize uh, cannabis uh, passed. Uh, a fifth in a conservative state, Arizona, came close to passing. Uh, four medical initiatives passed, three of them uh, new uh, medical states, one of them restoring uh, Montana, restoring a law that had been gutted by the state legislature. Uh, I was in uh, California at the time, and I uh, flew up to Oakland to uh, uh, take part in the, uh, the big celebration organized by advocates there. Uh, and uh, it was the biggest uh, day in our cause in the more than 20 years I've been involved uh, in it. Uh, uh, but it was only a celebration on the surface because of uh, other things that happened that day. Um, uh, and the election of Donald Trump, of course, has thrown the future of uh, legalization and particularly of our, uh, of our industry and uh, our uh, regulatory structure for servicing uh, the marijuana trade uh, into question. Perhaps uh, done that less so for the medical side of things. Um, still, I'm hopeful that we continue to have the long-term advantage uh, politically on this issue. Uh, now, when I first got involved in the 90s, things were a lot different. Uh, I, I, there had been few, if any, state ballot initiatives uh, on the issue, and uh, none which had been successful. Uh, medical marijuana, uh, if, I, if I'm correct, uh, consisted of a resolution passed by uh, a single major city, uh, San Francisco. Uh, there was a uh, medical cannabis club organized by uh, uh, the activist Dennis Perron, um, uh, built out of the uh, San Francisco AIDS community. Uh, in 1997, we had the first initiative on medical marijuana. Um, and uh, since then, 
uh, you know, medical marijuana. Now I think we're more than half of the states. Uh, there are uh, additional bills uh, permitting uh, use of uh, uh, CBD, cannabidiol, um, in, in more states, taking the number well over 30. Uh, these CBD bills uh, were driven in significant part by uh, uh, the knowledge that uh, it could help uh, children with uh, uh, certain forms of, of epilepsy that, uh, that are potentially fatal and extremely damaging. Uh, <laughs> I never dreamed before then that our breakthrough in the south of the U.S. would involve uh, supplying marijuana to children, uh, but that's how it happened. Um, now, of course, today we have legalization in eight states. Uh, the progression to get there uh, demonstrates a number of um, interesting and uh, possibly unique aspects uh, uh, to how things happen in the United States. Uh, one. Um, it demonstrates the limits of uh, federal power uh, versus states. Uh, we have uh, a system in which uh, federal law is supreme on this issue. Uh, no state law uh, can prevent federal agents from uh, arresting, uh, prosecuting uh, a provider of marijuana or a simple uh, possessor for that matter. Uh, however, our Constitution says that, at least in most cases, the federal government cannot commandeer the states, uh, and you know, they can't force the states themselves to criminalize uh, a drug transaction. Uh, but most of the law enforcement in the U.S. is state or local, and so uh, there's no effective even way of having a pretense of enforcing uh, cannabis prohibition uh, without the states actively participating it, in it. Um, and uh, this, is, this is why it's worked, uh, because uh, there are people who are willing to uh, uh, commit civil disobedience, in this case of a uh, financially based, often commercial kind, uh, with, uh, with a, a fair amount of political support for what they were doing. Uh, and, um, and then uh, laws protecting them from the state authorities. Uh, that said, uh, the federal government could have done a great deal more to uh, prosecute and, uh, and attack the, um, uh, the uh, supply side of medical marijuana or of, uh, or of legal marijuana. Uh, and uh, even at the times when it felt the worst, the number of prosecutions were really pretty few. Uh, tiny compared to what they could have been. And that's been the case under uh, several administrations now, both uh, uh, Democratic and Republican. Uh, now, uh, moving forward, we, uh, we found disagreements within uh, civil society, including our own movement. There are disagreements on how to structure legalization, disagreements over what type of laws to try to pass. Do we try to pass the big thing that has everything? or do we accept compromises in order to get what we can? And, and then what kind of compromises uh, do we accept? Um, for example, in uh, Washington State, I-502, uh, Washington and Colorado were on the ballot. And uh, most of us felt it was extremely important that uh, uh, they both pass. Uh, now, Washington had some controversial aspects. Uh, there was a uh, driving under the influence provision, which was based on a specific um, uh, blood uh, concentration threshold, uh, uh, which uh, was criticized as not being scientific. The criticism was valid, um, uh, but it was a political decision. The organizers believed, uh, rightly or wrongly, that uh, to get it passed, they needed to uh, exactly uh, mirror the structure of the, the state's alcohol uh, uh, alcohol driving under the influence law. Uh, also, uh, what contributed to uh, opposition uh, within our movement uh, was uh, uh, it did not have a uh, home cultivation provision. Uh, for me, uh, my view was, well, uh, of course, we want there to be personal cultivation allowed, uh, but we, we want to pass legalization most of all. Some advocates uh, went so far as to argue that it's not legalization uh, if it doesn't have home growing, even if it allows people to legally sell, distribute, possess, and, and consume marijuana, which I thought was an, a nonsense argument, despite um, my sympathy for uh, 
uh, home growing. Um, and uh, the, uh, the likely impact of the drive under the influence law was also uh, greatly exaggerated by opponents. The initiative did well. Two years before, though, in California, uh, we saw um, in Prop 19 a good deal of opposition from within the um, uh, cannabis community itself. Uh, California uh, built up this uh, a very substantial uh, and very open medical system, and uh, legalization uh, means change. It threatens some people's livelihoods. It uh, uh, threatens to change a uh, type of community that uh, uh, they feel part of and that has its uh, uh, has its uh, uh, good aspects. Um, there was fear of what a commercialization, large-scale commercialization of, of marijuana would do. And uh, Prop 19 failed. Um, it's, it's borderline whether it could have passed had there not been the internal opposition in the movement. Now, we, we have passed, uh, uh, we passed the initiative in California now, and there was a lot of uh, debate, disagreement over just how to write that. Uh, fortunately, people uh, did come together. Um, now, uh, moving forward, um, you know, there's great uncertainty what's going to happen under the Trump administration with Attorney General Sessions. Uh, the medical system probably is safe. Uh, the uh, regulated system, uh, we don't know. You know, if they decide to uh, send threatening letters to uh, cannabis businesses or their vendors, they can probably shut down a lot. Uh, and the statements have really been ambiguous. The best, most likely prediction I've heard, or I think is most likely, is uh, that there'll be a somewhat meaner version of what we have now. Uh, but as I said, I'm hopeful we still have the long-term advantage. Um, we've seen mainstream organizations support these uh, state regional conferences of the uh, National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, for example, NAACP, uh, supported several if not all of the uh, legalization initiatives. Uh, we see groups on our own sign on statements on international drug policy, which include uh, um, aspects that relate to legalization, even uh, if they uh, don't always call directly for it. Um, so uh, we've, we've come a long way. It, it's a completely different world uh, than uh, when I first started doing this. And, uh, uh, but we're going to have uh, an interesting uh, few years ahead. Thanks a lot. Thanks a lot. So um, I want to say that uh, this conversation keeps open because the Legal Regulations Fora has three events. The next two events will be somehow discuss how to implement this innovative experience, how to create the consensus, uh, how to work with the academic world. And uh, so tomorrow at 1, there's the second event, the Academic Conference on Legal Regulation. And at 2 o'clock, we have the Forum of Authorities on Legal Regulations. Thank you for being here, and let's keep discussing.